It's important that we, you know, guide artists and take care of them on a psychological level as they begin to rise because everything changes. And the truth is people think that we change, but it's not us that changes, it's everyone around us that changes. And if we could be more careful with the human spirit, um, not just for the artists, but for everyone, I think that intervening early, teaching people about kindness, teaching people about compassion, uh, teaching people about uh, how to reach out and be there for someone, uh, even when they don't even know that they're sad. and It might be so deep that they can't even pinpoint it. Uh, I think that that's very important, and I think it's something that's touched on in this film as well. Yeah, very well said. Yeah. Well. Go ahead, yeah. Hi. Uh, amazing film. Absolutely loved it. Uh, my question is for Bradley. Um, I went to see The Elephant Man in 2014, and uh, after the show, you gave me advice that changed the trajectory of my life as an actor and as a drama student. So I just wanted to know, God, what did I say? What was the advice? <laughs> you, you can't sleep. You can't and tell me so I can learn. <laughs> it, it, it actually was in the film um, that in the next week I, I had an audition with the cast and director of Limitless, coincidentally, um, but it had a lot to do with your individualism is your strength and not yeah. trying to be like everybody else. And the cast and directors need you more I than would say, them. Never mind. I was going to say um, so my question to you is, uh, as a director and as a writer of this film, since this is your first time being a director, um, what advice changed the way that you approach this filmmaking? You know, uh, thank you for saying that. You just made my day. Um, uh, did we meet, I said that to your face? Yes. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I, I know maybe it's crazy, but I feel like I remember it. Um, Georgetown's question. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, the advice that I got was, uh, posthumously, it was I watched a documentary with Mike Nichols. It was like a week before we started shooting, and I think it was a doc, it was a it was a Q and A that he had done close to his death, actually. And they asked him how he approaches directing, and he said, "I approach it the same way I approach acting. I prepare as much as I can. I show up on set and I throw it all away." And that really gave me the the the, the license, the confidence, the the courage, because I hadn't. That is how I act, and I thought. That feels like that's how I wrote the script. It's how we collaborated and prepped. It's how we talked about it for two years, you know, when we were just morphing. It's how we all did it on set. And hearing Mike Nichols do that and seeing the work that he had done, I thought, okay, that's that gave me the confidence to do it like that. Uh, yeah, let's go right there. Oh, yeah. Wait, did you get the part? Like, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get the part, but I was on Law and Order last weekend. So. Hey, 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 hey. Hey. Uh, you go right, yeah, go ahead. Thanks. And then we'll go to you. Okay. Hi, I'm Bradley Neil Smith from BBC News in the UK. Could you say a little something about shooting in Glastonbury and were the crowd receptive? Uh, did the weather play its part? And the mud there is famous. So how did you deal with it? Yeah, I, ca I can't say enough about Glastonbury. Glastonbury is, if no question, the, it had been, I've gone the past six years. This last summer was fallow, so it was the first time I missed it. But it, it was, it, it, it helped. Uh, propel everything that this movie is. Uh, I, I was able to, you spend four days there, and I learned so much about just the, the inner workings of what it is to put on a show. So to actually be there, and that Nick and Emily, who uh, it's, the, it's the largest privately owned music festival in the world, and it, it is the place that makes careers and can rejuvenate careers. There's that 3 p.m. slot on Saturday that Lionel Richie did in Dolly Parton, and it just recatapulted them. And it's a really magical place. It's a magical place. And you watch major, huge musicians still get nervous. They talk about playing the pyramid stage at Glastonbury is still this place of fear and, and beauty. And so it is a really incredible festival that I urge everybody to go to, if you can. Um, and Nick and Emily were kind enough. I don't know if anybody's ever shot a fictional movie there. Glastonbury has been portrayed in movies, but it hasn't been Glastonbury. And uh, it's a crazy story. Chris Christopherson, who came to set, happened to be playing Glastonbury last summer. And we, I asked him if we could, because they said, we'll let you come on the pyramid stage, but you have to let somebody play into your set, time-wise. Right, right, right. And he said, sure. So, Matty Libatik, myself, Steve Marr, the sound guy, that was it, we went to Glastonbury. My buddy usually handled the other camera just because we knew we had four minutes. And, uh, and it, was, it was unbelievable. I just didn't want the movie, I didn't want this to make a movie about music without Glastonbury being an element. I wanted those flags. I wanted what that, you know, so people who know music will be like, oh, well, yeah, that's Glastonbury. Uh, right here. Uh, 
Icon London magazine. Um, listening for you here, it seems like um, there is a large place for synchronicity or these magical coincidences uh, during the filmmaking or film uh, preparation to the film. Like you mentioned, uh, you met, you've heard Stephanie singing live just the day before you went to see her. Um, so I'm wondering, um, does the synchronicity or these uh, little coincidences, does it play a large part in filmmaking, you believe? I think it plays a large part in life. Um, I think true art can only be created if you're completely open to for moments to occur. And, and I think that's what I hope was the fun that we all had on set every day. You know, I remember Dave and I, you know, we were, we would go back in the house. Like, when, once, once we left that house and sat on that bench, it was like we were in this live universe, right? And then we would huddle in between and just talk through stuff. What about this idea, that? And then we'd go back into this large universe where you don't know what's gonna happen. You know, and the more that, the more I know that I stay open, the more, art can be created. And if I'm thinking about it too much, I, I, I'm dead. We were talking about this last night. You know, it's, it, it's the only way that I know that, that, because really art is just something that's out there and then if you're open, it flows through you. It's nothing that you really create. That's the way it feels experientially to me at least. Uh, I feel like you also like make an environment where you can channel that kind of inspiration. Like something about the culture you said, Tell you, man, it's very unique. It was like it was really fun to be there. It's like beautiful to be there. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. So I guess that that then so those moments you're talking about occur because of that, and then we use the word synchronicity for that. Hi, Justin Gerhardt from Queer Network News. Um, this is for Lady Gaga, Stephanie. Just talking a little bit about the transformation that you've made personally from being Lady Gaga, this huge queer pop icon, and then we've seen you start to act more and more and more, and, and we've seen it all be stripped away. So just a bit about that for you and what that's been like, that, and how the queer community has influenced some of that. Uh, thank you, Justin. You're um, well, I do love makeup, <laughs> and I love fashion and costumes and drag, uh, and I do a lot of it myself, um, uh, but, you know, sort of tying into the last question, I think it was the friendship that we developed together uh, where I really trusted him in exposing myself in a way that I've never exposed myself before. Uh, he wanted no makeup on my face. During the screen test, he took a makeup wipe and yeah. wiped it down my face, and I, th I was like trying to trick him yeah. with my no makeup makeup. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, he looked at the makeup wipe and it was all, you know, you know, brown and concealer and he was like, take it off. Uh, so we took it all off and I, I dyed my hair my natural color uh, uh, quite a bit before we started filming because I wanted to get into the character. And uh, it was a, a challenge, but it was also very liberating. And to me, anytime I'm doing anything, especially with an actor of his caliber, and I've always been such a huge fan of Bradley, and uh, was so excited to be the first you know, lead actress in his film, I wanted to give everything that I had, every last drop of blood, everything, all my fear, all my shame, all my pain, all my love, all my kindness, everything, I wanted to give it to him, and I wanted to give it to everyone on this couch. So. Um, what I will say is, is just that, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with the family that was created and that came from the top. And every single person on set, from the cast to the crew, from the top to the bottom, uh, we were a family and every day was, was beautiful. And um, uh, as far as um, my relationship with the gay community, like I said before, I, I would not be here without the gay community and how they have wrapped their arms loving me Arounding me, around lo lovingly wrapping their arms around me. Um, it's uh, something I'm very grateful for, and it's something that I'm also very grateful for that Bradley honored in the film. Uh, I think it's very beautiful, and to be honest, I just feel very lucky to be here. I, I I'm uh, a, a East Coast Italian American from New York who dreamed of being an actress, and I didn't make it, so I gave up and pursued singing, and I'm here today because this man believed in me, and um, that's also a lot of what this story is about, is the power of believing in someone and what that can do for the human spirit. 